Welcome to the Global Square, Globala Torget, på bokmässan at the Gothenburg Book Fair. Uh, we are the Global Square is uh, uh, where the civil society meets uh, the civil society that works in the on the globe outside Sweden. Uh, we, I'm Martin Angeby. I'm the Secretary General of Silk, the Swedish International Liberal Center. We are here to talk about Ukraine, and we're going to talk about a brand new book. Uh, called Ukraine Adrift. Uh, it's published by the European Liberal Forum. It's a republishing of the book I Ukraina på Drift, uh, which has been published in Swedish and Ukrainian. Uh, I have the author here, Mr. Paul Frigius. Welcome. Thank you. I have as a, as a commentary, we have Maria Nilsson, a member of the Swedish parliament from Gothenburg and a very experienced Ukraine traveler. Uh, and we also have Olga Neman uh, who uh, works for the Council of Women's Initiatives, and you, you. you will you will mention uh, probably what this is. Uh, but let's start with the, you, Paul. Um, who are you really to uh, take yourself the right <laughs> to write a book about <laughs> uh, about the country that you're not from? A, a very good question. Actually, I'm a journalist. I'm writing mostly about media matters in Sweden. Uh, I work for the Jun J Swedish Journalists Union's magazine for several years. And uh, my attempt here to go to Ukraine is that it's a country that is very much hidden from the sight of ordinary Europeans, I would say. Uh, so it was very much, I went as a representative for as a, the average European to discover Ukraine. And, and I think it's also a very, uh, a country well worth discovering. Mm. Thank you. Maria, you have read the book. What does it tell us about Ukraine that we, that we don't know? What do we discover when we read this book? I think you, you put it very well that you... I would, I would have gone to the, probably the same place as if I would have written the book as you do. You uh, put the finger on, on uh, the west and the eastern sort of potential divide but i think you go beyond that and uh, also look at the parts of of uh, the situation for minorities as you travel to Ushgorod in the western western part of ukraine and you touch upon the sort of globalized or central european area of lviv so uh, Thank you, uh, Olga. We will really go into Ukraine as well, but let's talk about the book first. How, how does it feel as a Ukrainian to, to read this book uh, written for uh, a European audience or a, a Swedish audience in the first um, place? Uh, actually, for me, it was very interesting. And uh, even um, I honestly got some new facts. And uh, for me, it was important to remember the chronology of historical um, unfortunately, horrible situations even, uh, but uh, they bring us the, the, that point that we have now in Ukraine and how who we are, Ukrainians, for this uh, time. And I'm um, really, very appreciate for that. And uh, also give many thoughts what can be done to, to make situation better. That's a very good point. I mean, I think the whole uh, Ukraine uh, for now is trying to figure out who they are or yes. who we are. Uh, the, the identity part is very important for the Ukrainians since it has had this sort of half Russian identity or half Polish identity for many years. And now we're trying to establish a new country, only 30 years old. So now we're trying to establish some idea of who they are. And they're not really, haven't, you haven't really figured it out yet. How do you see the identity crisis? How can you see the, those two identities uh, in conflict? Yeah, well, I think uh, the, 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 you see it very much how they refer to themselves when, when you talk about things. And, and in the end, when I started out this book, I, I thought they had passed from this sort of post-Soviet identity into something else. But it's still very much uh, alive, this Eastern, Western identity or European or Russian identity fight. When people refer to, when they do something wrong, we said, ah, it's because I'm Russian, uh, it's because of the, the Soviet heritage and so on. So re refer to that as an explanation for several things and why things go wrong. Because <laughs> it may not be true, but uh, it's something that pops up in a general discussion about their everyday life in, in Ukraine. Yeah. And, and now I would just want to add, it's not only it's not a Soviet 
solely, uh, and I realized that gradually being there, it's not solely being post-Soviet, it's very much being post-Russia, uh, so to speak. Uh, Soviet was not such a long time. Yeah. Uh, Maria, you move in Western European circles and you've spent a lot of time in, in Ukraine. Do you think, or in which way does Ukraine actually fit in to Europe? Does it fit in in Europe? Should it, uh, should it be a natural uh, process to integrate U Ukraine in the rest of the European Union? I hope so. Uh, but I think th that, first and foremost, has to be Ukraine's own choice. Uh, as a European Union can, of course, uh, encourage that and welcome that in all ways possible. But when it comes to it, it should be Ukrainians' own choice where to go. And I think that, speaking of identity, I think now is, is the time when Ukraine has sort of started realizing it. It's their choice. We are not depending on Kreml. We are not depending on something else. We really are the master of our own. So. Olga, now there seems to be a majority in Ukraine for an independent Ukraine and a Ukraine that's moving westwards rather, rather towards Russia. Uh, but are people actually ready to um, let go of some of the more traditional ideas that they have had in Ukraine or they just want to get, out, get in, into Europe without changing themselves? Yeah, we have this uh, specific, I would say, in Ukraine that uh, we are, I mean, majority of Ukrainians, they actually choose and we, we, we see uh, the, this this choice that we want to be a part of EU. Like officially, I mean, um, um, I think the revolution of dignity, is, uh, it's a big point for us and where we show that, no, we are not, not we not want to back to Russia. We, uh, we anyway, we are like European country in the, in the, uh, European Union, uh, I would say, borders. Uh, but at um, the same time, yeah, I mean, Ukraine is a very free country in uh, any senses of this world. Mm -hmm. So we want uh, everything to live uh, um, open and uh, free. And uh, um, But we want to keep this freedom, mm -hmm. um, which has like two sides freedom in a good way and uh, freedom in some in uh, not very good way mm -hmm. um, and at the same time being the the members of you so this is the point mm -hmm. half of the freedom that you're talking uh, about is kind of anarchical yeah. is that a new phenomenon or 10 years ago you were also an anarchy but without freedoms or no, I think it's not a new phenomenon I think mm -hmm. it's uh, it's just uh, now we have more um, structure uh, way uh, where we want to be but in the same time we want to feel this um, um, energy of freedom mm -hmm. and uh, to fix it how it is right now so of course you know that in ukraine uh, um, i think in ukraine is really like free country not only in post-soviet uh, among post-soviet countries but in general maybe it is one of the the most free country in europe even mm -hmm. i would say maybe it it so sounds very loudly but uh, mm -hmm. but freedom have al has always like two two sides in mm -hmm. of the again yeah. and uh, we still have a high level of corruption we still can uh, I don't know to um, to ruin some rules in the country, and for us it will be okay. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 this is also the freedom mm -hmm. on our understanding, you know. Mm, yeah, Ma Maria, yeah, you are a, a liberal, so you like freedom. Is, uh, do you agree with the, that? And you traveled a lot to Ukraine. Do you agree that it's a, it's one of the freest countries in 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 Europe? Do you also feel free when you're in Ukraine? <laughs> it's a uh, yes, but I am not maybe not the one you should be asking because yeah. uh, I'm not sure. I still think that there are people who don't feel free in Ukraine, especially if you don't live in the Kiev area or in mm. the the bigger cities area. You still have uh, challenges regarding xenophobia and and. Uh, so on, and if you belong to a Roma m minority, especially in Ushkorod area, it, you have been uh, exposed to a lot of tra um, discrimination and so on. Mm. So no, it's not a free country 
but it's not a free country for, for people in Sweden either. I mean, we have our problems, of course, as well. But uh, I can, of course, see the progression if I look back from where I, I first began to travel to Ukraine 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh -huh. the, how the country has improved and, and the people and, and what you talk about, it's amazing in only 20 years of time. Mm -hmm. What made you want to go in the first place? Um, I'm sure you two had it, I, you two as well, but I mean, your university years, you have this in belief that you can change the world and it's not, a th in three, in not only in theory, but in, in practice as well. So I went there a summer to work with uh, uh, children, orphanage uh, in, um, in camps. But it's a very, uh, I think the question about freedom here is also about what you put in the, the world freedom. Uh, and you mentioned that it's in a good and a bad way. And I think it's about this thing about the identity being form and the rules are not fully set. Because Sweden is a country with, uh, first we have the tradition of having a lot of rules and following, obeying all the rules. And now we have the uh, European Union giving us another set of rules on top of that. So we're sort of double, we have a double set of rules and we love obeying some of them. And we're pretty obedient. Whereas in Ukraine, that could be a sanctuary or refuge if you're tired of all the rules. Uh -huh. Because it's all, nothing is engraved, nothing is set in stone, everything is about to happen now. And I think that's what you were referring to in, yeah. in many ways. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, we tend to forget <coughs> now, but there is a still, still a war going on in the east of Ukraine. How does that manifest itself in, in the culture? I mean, uh, yeah, in a very... Um, uh, paradoxical way because in many ways this war of course was very bad but at the same time what the Putin's war which it has been has also been a, a catalyst for making Ukraine Ukraine moving towards Europe in a more uh, in a more coherent way uh, before that, it was more of this division between East and West within U Ukraine, but now being cut off Crimea and sort of uh, Donbass being in a more insecure position, the rest of Ukraine is very is clearly moving westwards. Mm. Mm. So in that way, the Putin war has been a blessing for the, the European identity of, of Ukraine. Um, Olga, you are from from Donetsk originally, now live in, in Kiev. Uh, what's your perspective on, on, on this war? Do you also see it as a blessing? I, I'm <laughs> sure you don't mean it's a blessing. But, uh. um, um, I think it was an, uh, in some kind of uh, blessing in, uh, in the gaps. Yeah. Um, um, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a blessing, but that it was a big push mm. on this... Uh, mm, try to 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 choose uh, the way of development that this is true uh, it was like a, a last drop maybe in the society like we understood that no we definitely don't want to go forward the Russia uh, we are different and um, we see the specific in Ukraine among even uh, other post-soviet countries we very strong nation I think um, and now we form in our own army also this is a push because uh, before the, the war, it was destroying. Mm. All the militaries in Ukraine were destroying. But now we are quite strong, I would say. We can protect our borders. Of course, with the help of international partners, of course, we understand it. But this is two different armies now, mm. before and after. And I think it's also, for us, it's important because um, we, through the border, we have our um, enemy for, for this. Mm. Uh, point it's, it's Russian Federation mm. not only physical it's also like moral I would say uh, pushing on us and forming our mentality who you are mm. we are Europeans mm. Ma Maria you are a member of the defense committee when you discuss uh, Ukraine in the defense uh, committee what what are you talking about well I would say that you said that I, I'm you didn't mean it but sort of a being a blessing and mm. in creating an identity, a united identity and moving towards EU. Uh, but the biggest 
hindrance aside from corruption to moving further with the EU membership is the conflict or the war, I would say, in Eastern European. And that is uh, sort of the Putin narrative to keep these conflicts frozen. Now it's not even frozen, it's half frozen, I would say. You see it in Donbass, you see it in, in Transnistrian, in Moldova, and you half see it in Armenia, Azerbaijan, with the Nagorno-Karabakh. As long as you can keep, from the Kremlin's perspective, keep these conflicts semi-frozen, it keeps Ukraine from moving fully onwards and upwards and on to, to Europe and the EU membership. Mm -hmm. But uh, identity-wise, if you just talk about the identity, this simmering conflict uh, is establishing f uh, more firm identity, which is European. That, uh, that was my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the stories you narrate in the <coughs> book, you meet somebody in, in a train and it turns out he doesn't like Russia at all, uh, mm -hmm. but he doesn't like some of the European values uh, either. No. Can, you, can you tell us this story? Yeah, that was just a typical uh, <coughs> one of those uh, wake, wake up to reality calls. That was just a, a fellow, a, ni a nice man who said he was, uh, he'd been to Chernobyl and cleaning up. He was one of the cleaners in uh, Chernobyl and <coughs> we befriended he had his family there and they offered me all kinds of uh, food and stuff and he he just said that uh, he, he said russia and putin is like hitler and he really ukraine, ukraine is good if it wasn't for the russian influence and so on uh, and and you sort of ascribe a lot of uh, uh, virtues to a person you meet like that and all of a sudden said but he said to me paul beware of kiev why you know, the homosexuals, they're having this pride parade and so on. So, <laughs> and that sort of turns everything upside down. But also, also it goes back to what you said, Olga, about everything being possible. In, in Ukraine, you can, you can say whatever you want. You can uh, cheer uh, Stepan Bandera, who was a fascist, and put him on a statue, and you're allowed to cheer him. And you can, if you're an oligarch and have a lot of money, you could finance a part of the uh, the army, uh, a little part of the army, which is one of those do whatever you like moments in uh, what you can experience in, in Ukraine. We have uh, very little time left. Uh, Olga, last words. Why should um, people come to uh, Ukraine right now? What's going on in the country that's really worth uh, being a part of? I think we have fantastic people, actually, uh -huh. and uh, delicious food. I mean, everything agreed that the food in Ukraine is fantastic and uh, very interesting uh, places to visit. Kiev, Lviv, Odessa, Kharkiv came. I mean, just come, please, and uh, it's fantastic. But you need to, to, to meet with people. Mm -hmm. They're very smart and, uh, yeah. and fun and mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, Maria, when will we see uh, Ukraine inside Europe? You mean the European Union? Yes. Uh, <laughs> maybe in uh, 20 years' time, I hope. Uh -huh. So do I. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, Paul, any, any, any last words? Uh, Why no. should you read the book? Uh, I think it's a, the g book is comprised of uh, 12 chapters that are portraying uh, some key, uh, key pivotal moments or, 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 or issues in Ukraine. So I think it's very, I think, I think it's entertaining enough to, to be worthwhile reading. It certainly is. You're a really good uh, storyteller. So thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you, Maria and Olga, for participating in the seminar. Thanks for, for, for the people listening. <laughs>